Hey, good morning. My name's uh, Gary Matsuoka, and we're here at Laguna Hills Nursery in Santa Ana on Saturday morning. Today's class, uh, just things that, are, that we're selling at this time of year, dragon fruit, and our, our main uh, line of pomegranates is also ready. So we'll talk about dragon fruit first. So you know, 30 or 40 years ago, dragon fruit was, quote, a new crop in California. Now it's pretty standard, although most of, of people who have eaten dragon fruit haven't eaten the best ones. So they're you know, right now they're breeding new varieties and introducing new varieties almost every year. But a lot of the old ones are pretty good. So we'll talk about the ones that we've been selling for a while, just so you know. Now, it is a cactus. It's a true cactus. They are native from, they think, central Mexico down into the uh, Caribbean area and also northern South America down to about Peru. So a true cactus. They can get by with little water, but they don't produce well without water. Now, we know that they don't need that much water to, they don't use that much water because they're cactus, but they don't like dry soil either. So it doesn't take much water to keep them going. You know, they're trying to see if they can use it as a totally dry crop in California. No, you can't do that. It, it, you need ample, the soil's got to be amply moist to create the flowers and fruit, but the amount of water they use is not that high because it's got no leaves, it's just stems. And cactus are real good at storing water. Uh, what the typical cactus does, which other plants don't do, is they hold their breath during the daytime. So the typical cactus, all the pores in their stems are closed during the day when it's really sunny and hot, so there's no evaporation. And then they open their pores at night to exchange carbon dioxide and oxygen, you know, carbon dioxide in, oxygen out, while it's cool, so they're not using so much water. So you need to keep the soil moist, but the usage of water isn't super, you know, isn't all that high. So uh, that may be a good thing to, to grow this, to, you know, for the next few years, in fact, while we're in a drought situation. So, and as a cactus, they're not that slow. So most cactus, we know, you know, a few inches a year, foot a year, maybe. Dragon fruit, once they're established, we've seen them do 10 foot a year. Just incredible growth. And the fact that these are stems and not leaves, when you fertilize one of these, it's like the next day, the whole thing's greener. It really gets into their system quickly. So... Now they usually bloom from now, this is like the first bloom of the year. Uh, they started blooming a few weeks ago. And uh, they'll repeat the cycle two, three, sometimes four times um, all the way into November. And the fruit does, so they, they have several crops a year. Uh, the fruit ripens about 45 days after they bloom to about four months, depends how the warmer it is, the faster the fruit develops, the cooler it is, the longer it takes. I had some blooms in November, ripe fruit in February. So right in the middle of winter, it takes a long time. Interestingly, the fruit from the November bloom was the biggest I'd ever seen. So the longer it takes to grow the fruit, sometimes maybe like on other plants, the bigger the produce becomes. So. Not that it was better tasting in February. Usually the sunnier it is, the better they taste. So um, dragon fruit, just so you know, the exposure on them around here, probably full sun. Now, a lot of people grow in between houses. They don't have to have full sun to develop. Uh, when they first were brought to us, you know, they're growing them out in Temecula and those areas. They said, you can't put them in full sun. They burn. So we we were trying them in the shade for a while. Uh, they don't grow in the shade either. Uh, and around here, they don't, you know, we see a little bit of scorching during extreme heat, but in general, full sun. Full sun. It just kind of does something like that. 
this was right against the hot block wall. So, uh, but generally out in the open, uh, they don't, you know, they don't burn too easily. It's got to be unusually warm. When, you know, 2010, uh, we saw some burning in 20 and just a few years ago with that 20, 215 degrees, a little bit of burning, but not nothing that would kill the branch. I mean, you can have, uh, just so you know, the part of the stem that brings the water up seems to be a little core inside the center of this stem that brings the water upward. So as long as you don't lose that part, the stem seems to be okay. But sometimes we'll see all this rot off around it, and you just have this little wooden core in the middle, and the plant's fine. Doesn't seem to react to that. So, so more sun is better. <clears throat> now, then, most people use a support because they can. They'll take up less room. Now, I do have a friend who has horse property, and he just let us go on the ground. So you go to his house. He's got a pile of dragon fruit stems this high and about thirty foot across, and there's no way he can reach in further than a few feet. He says, yeah, the thing makes thousands of food a year. I can only reach maybe 100, but that's plenty for me. So he doesn't really worry about uh, supporting it. Now, if you're trying to do this for a living, yeah, you want to have more access to your fruit, have it take up less room. So most farms will have a support system for it so they can get the stem up over your head and then branching it like this so you can just walk underneath them and pick the fruit off the top rather than having to scramble around it. Now here at the nursery, we don't have much room. We grow them on our block wall. So these have aerial roots on the sides of their stems. They'll attach to just about anything. So they climb up walls quite easily, especially block walls. So you lean them up against something, they'll attach to it. So we just put them on our block walls. We have them on wall facing west. So they're getting all afternoons. And of course, the tops of them still produce the best fruit because they're getting sun in the morning too. So all day sun is, is the best. They actually have a, uh, a test orchard of these in Irvine at the field station, the University of California Riverside Field Station in Irvine there, uh, where they test a lot of the varieties and different systems of growing them. So we, in a lot of people's yards here, you see them make a wooden structure out of two by fours, just, you know, four sides, um, kind of a cage around them and have them just, the branches hang over that, that's fine. Uh, in the tropics, you know, one of the, the, they call them dragon fruit in, in the United States, you know, in Mexico, no, that's not what they called them. Um, in America, it's been known more as a strawberry pear because the fruit is, that's really what the fruit looks like. I didn't happen to get to the stores to buy anything, but yeah. fruit are like, the size of large artichokes, and they're fleshy. Now, this type of dragon fruit has no spines on it. There is a type that does have spines on it, but these, um, have a kind of a rubbery skin. It almost reminds you of a shower cap or a swimming cap. And you can peel it off the flesh very easily. So it's almost like, yeah, it's a nice container for the fruit. The seeds are about the size of strawberry seeds. You don't notice them when you eat them. The flesh can either be the original plant, the flesh was white. And more of the new varieties are this kind of this fluorescent pink. And there's a lot of in between also. I believe there's a yellow flesh one out now too, but I have not seen that or tasted it. Uh, the white ones, the original ones we got from people from Vietnam back in the 1980s. So the dragon fruit made it to Asia. They made it to Y first, then to Asia. 
uh, the Vietnamese people fell in love with it. So they brought me samples back in the 1980s. That's where this plant came from. And even though they're the best dragon food, I, I mean, the best cactus food I'd eaten up until then, they tasted like a bland watermelon. So like an underripe watermelon, uh, they were okay. But they were a little spectacular looking with the red skin and the white flesh. So, <clears throat> so we were mildly interested in them in those days. And then they started crossing with the red flesh varieties and got these flesh and pink ones. And suddenly the flavor went way up. It's like taking the best watermelon you'd ever eaten and adding some grape juice to it, some grape flavor to it. Quite good. Very sweet. Uh, sweeter than any watermelon you'll ever eat. So, uh, so they're, now we consider them, you know, maybe second to uh, mangoes and, and desirability. So that and this one here, Voodoo Child, is one of the original red. It's a real dark burgundy red flesh fruit. Very, very good. They just have to be a little small. That's why they cross the smaller red ones with the large white ones to get the in between uh, fluorescent pink ones. So now there is a yellow dragon fruit that's quite spiny. We don't. We haven't been able to sell them for a year or so because we ran out of plants, and we have to get our stock back up. But this is one of the yellow dragon fruits, and the fruit on it is spiny. The spines are easy to take off when the fruit's ripe. They just kind of break, you know, fall off the fruit. Really, you can just rub them right off. Um, the a lot of people think this one's the best tasting dragon fruit, and you know, it's it's awful good, but there's a lot of good dragon fruit. The disadvantage of the yellow, one crop a year. So the fruit itself takes five months to ripen, whereas these less than two months. Now, time on picking. The fruit will hang on the plant pretty good for a week after it turns color. After, you know, it goes from green to this red color. Uh, not all of them turn totally red. Some are just half red when they're ripe. But uh, when they turn color, I usually wait a day and then pick them. Maybe two days. If you wait a week, week and a half, sometimes they start being mushy inside, a little soft, although they're still really good. Okay, so the research we've seen claims that most of these are self-fertile, but a good dragon fruit grower always likes to help his crop out just in case. So the important thing is bees, just like any other flower. Now, the original white one, the one that didn't taste as good, the nice thing about it is it's almost totally self-pollinating too. So on the white one, so these are, the, this is the female part in the middle here. And these are the male anthers around it. And usually in the morning, there's a lot of pollen on them. And then the bees will be in here transferring the pollen. On the white one, as the flower closes, so the flower opens, say, 4 in the afternoon, 5 in the afternoon. Well, of course, we're on daylight savings time, so it's more like 5 or 6 in the afternoon. It opens up. The male pollen's not ready yet. The female part is ready. And then by the next morning, this is all covered. All these anthers are covered with bright pollen. And on the white one, as the flower closes, the pollen goes right onto the female part. So it's self, you know, it's, it's self pollinating, <laughs> self fertile and self pollinating. Whereas some of these, the female part isn't in the right spot. It's nice to transfer it by hand to that part just in case. And what a lot of uh, of the people who grow dragon fruit for a living do is they will go out in the evening and cut off these anthers, and put them in a bowl, and by the next morning, all the pollen's in that bowl. So they'll just go through a lot of flowers, cut off the pollen, and then in the morning come and dab it onto the female parts of that plant. Um, all these only open for one night. And close the next morning by eleven. They're they're 
shutting down. So, you know, it varies. Uh, sometimes if it's a cloudy day, they'll stay open a little longer. And then at that point, 45, 60 days later, you got a ripe fruit on here. It's ready to pick. Now, just so you know how these grow, so this is so they don't have any leaves. These are all stems. On a cactus, the spines are the leaves. That's what they were. But they have these nodes where the spines are attached. Each node can either grow something. Can grow something. You can either grow flower bud like this one's doing. Here is the flower bud, or the node can grow a new stem like these are doing. So it can do one of two things. You can encourage them by cutting the branch. So they say in the spring that um, most uh, people who own dragon fruits will take this branch, a mature branch, and cut six inches off the end of it. And all these buds here now figure they got to do something. They just got cut back. So either they're going to bloom or make a new branch. And each node can only do it once. So you can you can look at your stem. You know, the older the stem gets, the thicker it gets. You can see this thing is almost like a triangle. It's almost a pure triangle where these are kind of still real thin. They're still capable of blooming. This one's still a fairly mature branch. But the older the branch gets, the and generally the more sun exposure it has too. You can see this branch here. Uh, Originally it was grown in the shade. You can see the shape of it is just two sided, but it's real fat now, so it's got this flower bud growing on it. They tend to bloom better on second year branches, but you know this is just the first year branch. It's only about a year old. It's already got a flower. But uh, when I first started growing them, you know we thought they were shade plants, so mine took like three or four years to really get going. Um, the horizontal branches seem to fruit a little better than the vertical ones, just like any other plant. The horizontal branches get sunlight, a little bit better exposure there. <laughs> now, we don't sell as many rooted plants like these as we do cuttings. So, just because these things are really heavy, <laughs> it's all water weight. So, when you have you know, like 10 branches like this one has, it already weighs about 40 pounds or so. It's real. And it's kind of brittle, it's just harder to handle. So we usually start the cuttings in May is usually the first month we like to do cuttings because it's too cool at night in April. Cuttings is rough. You can start them inside, of course. So the ideal cutting, you can see this piece here. This is several years old. It's got a flower bud actually forming at the tip there. And you can see it had either branches or flowers already in several places so this is a pretty mature branch this is a nice one to sell so when we take cuttings we'll put the name on it put the date we did the cutting maybe put an arrow on there to see where it's up um wait one week five days at minimum but a week for this area to dry off and heal over so this is an open wound right now if you stick this right into the dirt it's just going to rot on so you got to wait a week for this to heal over. Now, this the only part that roots is the very end. So you don't need to stick this very far in, but it won't support itself too well unless you do support it. So we usually tie them to a stake, put the stake deeper in the ground, and then get this in the dirt at least an inch or so. You put them in deeper, a lot of this side stuff just rots away. I mean, at least they're still okay. And a lot of times we tell people, well, they, you know, if you have a black plastic pot, little black plastic pot, they'll grow faster there than they will on the ground initially because the ground is still a little cool. Whereas a black plastic pot, if you can get it up high and get it sun exposed, it's nice and warm in there, they'll actually grow roots faster that way. And you can, you know, if you, if you have an open, a bright window in your house, you can start them in the winter if you wanted to get a head start on them, but they won't root outside if the nights are in the 50s. So. Now we do use 
our top pot potting soil to grow them in here. So this is our all-purpose soil, but it's perfect for cactus. We grow any kind of succulent in here. And when you have the right soil, you can water it as much as you want without danger of rotting. Of course, again, they don't need that much water, but uh, you won't hurt it if you water them every day. You can water them if you want every day, um, but they don't need that much. Uh, And fertilizer wise, there isn't too much written. I mean, around the world, they use chicken manure, all kinds of things, bat guano. We usually start things off with our osmocote, which is its chemical time release, just because it's quicker acting. But in the long run, it's better to go organic, like the down to earth fruit tree fertilizer or the doctor of fruit tree fertilizer or time. We do like this one a lot because it does have a decent amount of potassium, the sap of fruit, the juice of fruit, and of course the sap in plants. And basically that's all dragon fruit is, is all the sap um, is, potassium is the major salt that creates that, so. Now, in other parts of the world, um, they have trouble with wood structures. You know, if you're in Vietnam, if you have a wood post that you're using, it's not going to last very long. This rots away. So in a lot of the, and I've seen this even here, people that came here from Malaysia, because they're used to doing it with concrete blocks, they just tack up concrete blocks, make a column of concrete blocks about this high. You grow dragon food up four sides of it. This kind of arches out away from that, and then the fruit comes off of that. So I've seen that in about three or four yards in in Orange County, where they where they grow the dragon food their traditional way because the blocks will last longer in the tropics than either metal post or wood. And here most people use wood. Now, if you just use a single support. Two by two is not going to be strong enough. You got to go uh, four by four post. It's got to be really, this stuff is heavy. I mean, it is heavy. In a uh, two inch redwood stake, if you have something that size, usually within one year, it's it just too brittle after that. Wet wood, red, wet redwood uh, kind of snaps off easy after about a year. Yes. Can the can the wood be treated or killed or anything to help prolong the life of it? Yeah, but then it becomes poison. <laughs> That's the problem. When you treat wood, it is toxic material. Why not you want that around your edible plants? Is you know, I used to we used to use uh, railroad ties for everything. It's like okay, that's not good. <laughs> There's a reason why it doesn't rot. <laughs> This one, this particular plant, uh, I think it's its third year. We got the cuttings from a friend there about this tall, I believe it was just two winters ago. And then they grew this much this last, you know, that year and then more the year after. I mean, they're fast. They're really fast. Yes. Well, this one probably getting about two thirds a day as. It's 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 sitting on a bench on the west side of a wall. The top is getting full sun. The bottom is not. Okay, so there are some a lot of varieties. The best ones will will name. So still, I would say the best I've eaten. Um, so. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I'm spelling graffiti right or not. Uh, that's still about the best I've eaten, although there's a lot of them that are that good. Um, it's interesting, Paul Thompson, who wrote this, uh, 
first manual, one of the first manuals on uh, Pizza Haya or Dragon Fruit, he introduced a whole bunch of, of species and he started um, breeding them himself. He just had numbers and letters on them, sent them across the country to his friends, and they all came back with names of that era. So Visual Graffiti, Voodoo Child, Purple Haze, Dark Star, <laughs> Cosmic Charlie. <laughs> so we had a, you know, we we've been trying to figure out if which ones in his book that these guys represent, but like Voodoo Child was S10. I mean, you know, the of course there are breeding a lot of new ones, so uh, Physical Beanie. Another one that has been a favorite is Helen's Thomas. Um, this is now there's another name in Dragon. Paul Thompson was one of the first guys. Edgar Valdivia may be one of the big names right now. And supposedly this is supposed to be his best one, Edgar's Baby. Which just came out three years ago. We haven't eaten, you know, I'm sure some of these eaten by now. We had a whole bunch of uh, tissue culture plants uh, two years ago. Tissue culture is when they propagated in a lab instead of taking cuttings, which can mature real quick. They were getting these things look like seedlings that were this tall. So it took us a year to grow them. And then uh, this is probably from that original batch also. I have some in my house too growing. And uh, mine bloomed for the first time last year, but didn't set anything. So hopefully this year we can get some flowers and food off it to, to see how good that one is. But he, uh, Edgar, does do a lot of a nice dragon fruit with the dark pink blush. Real good, uh, sure. We have another one of his. Um, and he tends to have a lot of spinier genetics in there. This is also one of his called Michelle, which we have growing on a wall back there. The flowers and the fruit are a little different than these. They have the little different colored flowers. The the scales, the the, the petals are still white. Um, and the fruit is a little different colored than the ones we're looking at. They're more on his fruit. The scales usually have dark coloring around the edge of each scale, so the scales look prominent on the fruit rather than just being like this kind of pineapple like when you look at his fruit, kind of pineapple like. And one of our local experts brought me this one, which he says he grows commercial fruit up on a property, or he did up in the Kings up there. Uh, and he says this one, his, the mo his most sought after fruit is off of one called Al Grullo, which, you know, today with the moisture, it looks green, but normally it's more this color, kind of a blue uh, with uh, coating on it. And the fruit is a little bit more like uh, the scaly type fruit. And the flesh, which I would have to say has a somewhat creamy flavor. I have an old, I've only eaten a few of them from him, so I can't really tell you that's, that's characteristic of the fruit. But he says that's one of his restaurants and the people who he sells them to ask for the most is this El Guyo. But again, uh, I've right. only eaten two fruit on it, so. Now, uh, we have some customers who came from Korea. And interestingly, they have to grow them differently there because in the winter, Korea is way too cold for these. So, you know, here we can grow them outside all year. If you're anywhere else, you know, more than 50 more miles inland, they can freeze in the winter. Even here, they can freeze if we drop well below 30. We haven't seen that for quite a while, so uh, I'm not too worried. But back in 1990, we hit 23. 
that would have that did major damage on us. You lose entire branches on that. So, uh, but anyway, this customer from Korea, they would just the way they were doing this is they would have stems about like this, and every winter, even here, they would because this is what they always did. They just dug them out of ground, put them in their garage all winter. So this one long straight stem. And the next spring, they would take them out, redo the soil, put them back in, and they would grow them at a slight angle, uh, on a lean-to kind of thing. So they get good sun exposure. And she showed me pictures of you know, all the flowers and fruit they get off this one branch. So... And then next winter, they put that branch back in the garage again. It's interesting, but that's what they had to do in those cooler climates. So, yes. When they did that, did they have to, like, cut the bottom and then like, treat it like a cutting and root it? Or? Well, they just pulled the roots out, too. So they didn't have too many roots on them, but they had some roots. So there wasn't really any damage to the stem at all. Yeah. A lot of work, but uh, they got good results. <laughs> So you know, can't can't fault them for that. Yes. So I'm not sure of the, the legacy of the plants they were given to me by a friend. And a lot of where I went through was a lot of Vietnamese or you know, all. Well. But um right now I'm growing them in full sun in containers. And some of the ones that get more sun exposure have some same same thing on that limb. But the other limbs um, are turning yellow. Um, does that mean, is it fertilizer? It tends to be on when they have too much sun exposure. Yeah, it can certainly be a sunburn. I mean, that this year we had that 103 degrees in April, which wasn't good for many things at all. <laughs> too early in the year to get that hot. So it certainly could have been a sunburn. And if it's got that, you just cut that portion off or just leave it? Just leave it. It doesn't usually bother them that much. So. Yeah, I've got one growing on my metal shed that's turning mm -hmm. yellow, but it's used to be fine. It doesn't flower, that's why I'm here. Mm -hmm. yes. I, I saw a video with one of the old leaves and the man was singing it with, 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 with a magnesium mine with a salt. He said, he said, it was yellow because it was back in magnesium. So I started doing that after I did that. And then I don't have those stems as yellow as they were before. Uh -huh. Basically, it's like green now instead. No, no, yeah. Um, well, magnesium is one of the micronutrients, you just need a tiny bit. We don't seem to have too much trouble with them. If we just throw a good all purpose fertilizer on them, they green up a lot of times the next day. So, I mean, most, you know, this, like Osmocote's got. 11 minerals in it, so there's not much missing in this one. You wouldn't go over it on one mineral. Sometimes if you don't choose the right one, you really mess the plant up. And most organic things have 17 minerals in them. Any living plants need 17 minerals in them, and this is just a box full of ground up dead plants and animals. Yeah. Okay, I yeah, covered. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we have several flowers, but the bloom, and then afterward, the fruit part kind of turns yellow. Is that a pollination issue, or is that? Don't know. I mean, I would say if you don't, they don't get pollinated. Most of them will fall off. I mean, at our when we had a growing ground in Irvine, we were about a half mile from a bunch of beehives. And when I'd go out there in the morning, <laughs> there'd be like 10 bees in every flower. We didn't have to pollinate anything. You know, the, the bees were just there. Here, no bees. If we're hand pollinating, they'll work. If we don't hand pollinate, most of them fall off. So you got to have the bees around. They, they seem to be essential. Um, I, I tried later. <laughs> And so we'll see what happens. Yeah. Oh, uh, I forgot to mention there is so dragon fruit is related to orchid cactus. 
And a lot of our customers and my and my friends of mine have eaten the food on Orchid Cat and said it's sweet and bland. It's not much to think about. However, they have been breeding orchid cactus with these. And there is one now that we've eaten that's quite good. Uh, a pink flowering dragon seed called Connie Mayer. I don't think I have any around right now. We've been selling them as they get big enough to grow. But Connie Mayer was developed in Germany. And it is a pink flowered dragon fruit, and it actually tastes quite good, and it's pink blessed also. So, what was the name of the fluorescent? Well, physical feeding Helly's Comet are both real fluorescent. I mean, they're like fuchsia pink and sun. You know, you cut it open, you go, whoa. Because the red and the pink are a contrast, actually. There's enough contrast there that you, it looks like it's glowing when you open it up. Gary, if we get a cutting and then take it home and it's already been healed and everything, do we just stick it in the ground or is there something we're supposed to do? You could. You can go right into the ground or you can put it in a pot. The pot, you know, the coarser the soil, the sandier the soil, the faster they root and grow and the warmer the soil. So if you put them in a pot with our top pot, which looks like the stuff, well, we use top pot. They might grow a little faster initially than in the ground. So the growers have said, yeah, clay soil will slow them down the first year, but clay, they, they get going by the second year. Whereas in sandy soil, they're just fast. So we would go into a small pot and then transfer it into a bigger pot? Or, or into, into the, the ground. ground. They don't need much dirt. I mean, we can get huge plants in 15 gallon buckets. So again, they, you know, they're, they don't have a huge need for water. So you can actually grow, like I, we knew um, some people down in Fallbrook that had grown commercially. They use a seven gallon pot for commercial production. It's just a pot like this. They show their plants and them on stakes doing this. And that's they just do it that way. And every now and then they'll replant one in a new pot when they get old. And then, how long does it typically take for it to root before putting it in the ground? Or, I mean, typically, can you pull it usually out? you're good by three months. You're it's it's firmly rooted by three months of warm weather. It's got to be warm. I mean, some of my employees try to start some in November or some one year, and most of them fail. They just don't like the cold and, and the pots. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions on dragon food? Okay, so, well, yeah, um, this sign has about 600 names on it that I didn't mention, but again, these are the best. The Vietnamese white is nice to have just because the Vietnamese white is self-pollinating. And also, its pollen is good for all the other dragon fruit, too. There's supposedly there's some dragon fruit that have sterile, not good pollen. So it's nice to have it around just uh, as a pollen source for the other ones. So most people who grow dragon fruit will have a white one. They may not eat it, but they'll have it. <laughs> the house I'm at right now, there's white dragon fruit all over the place. <laughs> all over the place. So. Okay, pomegranates from a whole different part of the world. So, pomegranates uh, were originally thought to have evolved in India. Now, most of the ones we grow, they think were from the foothills of the Himalayas. So, they're deciduous in the winter for a short period, usually. Um, pomegranates, the leaves turn yellow in mid-December, fall off, and then start growing back. This year they started in February, so when it gets warm, they start growing again. Most years it's more like March. This year we had a real hot February. 
and then they bloom all spring, and then the fruit ripens in the fall. They don't need any chill. We noticed the winters when we had no winter, they just woke up earlier. So they just go by cool, sleep, warm, wake up and get going. I think 40 degrees at night puts them to sleep and then uh, get above 40s, get into the back of the 50s, they start going in winter. Now, um, For a hundred years at least, the main pomegranate sold in the United States was one called Wonderful. So Wonderful is the one you eat at the supermarket. So big, beautiful fruit. It was uh, essentially bred or found in Florida, and then California grows most of the pomegranates in the U.S. nowadays. But Wonderful is you know ripens in the fall, late fall, mid to late fall. It's got the big red fruit, red. They call them arrows around the seeds, that fleshy part. Uh, sweet tart, considered a sweet tart variety. So it's sweeter, it's not super tart, but it is tart comparatively. But it's got that wonderful flavor that people recognize. In Now, for a long time in, in Russia, they had a agricultural station down near the Black Sea. and there was a gentleman there, Dr. Gregory Levine, who collected pomegranates from that area of the world. So he went around the Middle East where pomegranates are really, really popular. Uh, Turkey, which is like the center of production, even though they evolved in India, the Turkey is now considered the center of production. Uh, so he had a whole bunch of pomegranate varieties. And as Russia was initially falling apart in the 1980s he called up the universities around the world and said you know i'm going to send you these collections because we're no longer in business here so the collection hit uh, uc davis uh, i got to uc davis in the early 80s and they had their first taste test in 87 and the russian varieties took the top seven spots so he had so the Original wonderful, you've eaten it. Uh, sweet tart. Uh, seeds are fairly hard. Some people swallow them. Some people chew them. Some people spit them out. Um, the top Russian varieties were all nicely flavored, sweeter. Seeds were soft and seeds were small. So when you're eating some of the top rated varieties nowadays, you don't even notice the seeds. You just eat them. So the, the top rated one and the taste test for, for the last 20 years has been Parfianca. But my daughter and myself both prefer Ariana which is this one. We're out of Parfiancas because it gets a lot of press and we didn't get enough plants this year. We have a lot of Arianas right now. And uh, it's, so the difference is, you know, when you have a taste test like on apples, most people tell you Fuji's their favorite. Well, among apple connoisseurs, Fuji is a bland apple. But to the general public, they tend to like bland sweet things. So Fuji is the tip taste winner, whereas people really like apples type, maybe Honeycrisp or or Pink Lady or one of those is better. So among uh, pomegranates, Parafianca is a taste test winner. My daughter and I both like Ariana better. It's got a little more flavor to it, a little more tartness to it than the Parafianca does. <clears throat> Number two, well, this is the one that on taste test, this is usually one. This is two, although in San Diego, a few years ago, Ariana was number one, Parfianco was number two. Number three is usually Dasarsky. Dasarsky alone. I can even spell that one. Now, we don't have any of these for sale right now. We're growing them. Uh, Dave Wilson Nursery, which has been 
growing these for quite a while, discontinued a lot of them. They said, we got so many of these that we, we're just continuing the ones that nobody buys. Well, unfortunately, Dasarsky is one of them. So we have been propagating Dasarsky ourselves just because we like that one so much. So Dasarsky, um, these are more like pomegranate. This one, they said it's like the best lemonade. And for a while we've gone, well, what does that mean? So four years ago, we had some ripe food on our Dasarsky. And so customer, I sampled this and your first, you know, thought on tasting it is it's, it's sweet. It's just a nice sweet one. But then when you're swallowing juice, it does the same thing that lemonade does. It catches you right in the throat. It's got that finishing astringency. And it, we thought, God, this is really good. This is a really good one. So Dusarski is another one that we really like and we're propagating ourselves. So. Fortunately, we sold our mother plants, so, so I have all these little ones will be growing uh, this year, and then um, I think they'll be ready uh, by fall. They're, they're slow to grow right now. So that's another, that's user rate number three. Um, and the Zerdny, which does mean dessert Russian, uh, which is just a nice sweet one. They, Say it's kind of similar to the orange juice. That's usually, I think, rated number five on the list. Uh, we have those in stock. And then um, pink satin. Now, you know, for a while, Dave Wilson was giving all their Russian ones um, English names, which really messed everyone. We're going, okay, what is this? So I think they've abandoned that. Pink satin, they're still giving it an English name. But it's probably better known by the name Seen Pepe in other countries. We have this one in stock too. It, it's in the top, it's probably in the top 10. Seen Pepe means no seeds, but it does have seeds, they're just small and soft. And this one has kind of a fruit punch flavor. And it's also a nice one. So we have, uh, well, we don't have any car because we have Ariana. We do have a few water folks around, but people like the traditional one. The Zertany Eye and Pink Satin are out there at the moment. Um, now, there are some oddballs. So these are all traditional pomegranates, but we do have our own exclusive variety. This one's a little bit young yet. We're selling the one gallon of it at the moment. Because all this is the one gallon and five gallon pot. This is a tropical pomegranate uh, called Aaron. Um, <clears throat> so most pomegranates, they bloom in the spring. Uh, the fruit ripens in the fall. Aaron is tropical. It's from apparently from the south, evolved in the southern parts of uh, of India. So it's it just flowers and fruits year around. So one of my neighbors, um, who's I believe he's an importer, he was over in Singapore twenty years ago, maybe a little longer than that, eating pomegranates in Singapore, and he, he liked this one because it was sweet, soft seeds. So he brought some seeds back with him in his yard. And in his backyard, he's got this tree with about eight by eight, which is a typical pomegranate size. And any day you go there, he's got flowers and fruit and fruit ready to eat on the tree. It just, it then never stops. It just blooms and fruits year round. Uh, not quite as distinctive a flavor as Ariana, but certainly, uh, you know, his, his relatives all want trees of these. Everybody likes it. It's it's a beautiful plant since it's ever blooming and ever fruiting. Typical fruit size, uh, kind of a lighter color, more of a say a cream to pink to light red fruit, depending on the sun exposure. Light red flesh, soft seeds, not as small a seed as the Russian ones, but still soft seeds. So you just eat it. But it's a good ornamental plant too. On top of that.
and it's also much quicker to produce than the regular ones. So on a regular pomegranate, now if you're in Riverside or Central Valley, most pomegranates, even when they're this big, will fruit the very first year. They like that. If they get plenty of energy from sunlight all spring, they tend to produce right away. We know this because 2014, when we opened here, hottest spring I've ever I ever can recall. No clouds at all. Uh, 90 degrees all spring long. Almost every single, I mean, I would say all but maybe one or two pomegranate trees we had, even ones this big, have fruit on them. <laughs> okay. They're fruiting when they're very, very young. And then the next year, totally socked in all spring, only two of our trees had flowers and fruit on them. So we saw the difference that sunlight makes to these, the sunlight and heat. So uh, these... You know, if it's if we're stuck with cloudy springs, it may take three or four years to make fruit. Although you can see this tree on its third year is has got a good crop. But I remember when when I first grew pomegranates in the 1990s, um, my trees took five years of fruit. We're having a typical spring, and I live a little closer to the ocean than here. So uh, it took five years to get the first crop on three different pomegranates. But typically now we expect it second or at least by the third year to make good fruit on them. But the Aaron, you always get fruit within one year because they bloom year around. Uh, so they flower all summer or all fall. Once they get, you know, a couple feet tall, they start blooming. So it's the quickest one to fruit. Now we know. Even this one here, you've got flower buds. Not as distinctive as those sweet, sweet, mild flavor, but soft seeds. But if you didn't know, uh, pomegranate flowers look like, typically look like this. Now it's nice to have uh, two varieties run. You get a little better fruit set than just one tree, but most of our customers just have one tree. They said they get plenty of fruit. But commercially, they always put at least two varieties in the orchard. <clears throat> you get a little better production if they're cross pollinated. And so, pomegranates are considered drought tolerant plants. However, they're not, you know, you don't want, if they're dry, they won't flower or they won't, they abort their flowers. So, make sure they're wet and they don't mind water. I mean, at my last house I lived at, we planted our pomegranates in a low spot. <clears throat> in the 1998 El Nino that year, you know, rain till June, they were sitting in a pond of water till summer. And I thought, boy, these things aren't going to make it. But they were just fine. They, they had a great crop that year, sitting in, uh, you know, about this much of water in a low spot in my yard. So the water didn't hurt them. Uh, they don't need that much water to survive, but they certainly like water to, to you know, for good production. <laughs> now, back in the 80s, and before the Russian ones came out, there are some uh, famous ones that you might still hear a lot of because a lot of nurseries still sell the older varieties. So we had Wonderful, and then uh, they started developing the soft seeded ones in the U.S., and there's one called White, which has, um, and there's one called Utah Sweet, which are full size fruit, light colored skin, light colored flesh, uh, kind of bland flavor, but the seeds were soft. And then there's a um, famous one called Eversweet, and this is still advertised a lot. But it's not perfect. I would I would prefer getting the Russian varieties over Eversweet. But Eversweet was uh, essentially clear fleshed, soft seeded, but it's not without its faults. So Eversweet, um, you know, the first time I grew that, the first crop it had, it had hard seeds and red flesh. I'm going, wait a minute, did I plant the wrong tree? But by the 
second year it had third year it had fruit this the flesh was totally clear or i mean it was quite flush and soft seeded so uh, a lot of things a lot, lot of fruits the first crop is not proper but this one the problem we had with ever sweet and we always had the same problem is the flowers the flower ends stay closed like that whereas on most pomegranates the flower end is the trumpet on ever sweet like this, we see it's open trumpet too. Eversweet, it always closed down on itself. And what we saw a lot on Eversweet was it was rotting inside there and the rot would go from there into the, into the rest of the fruit before the fruit was ripe. So we had to do is cut this part off when the fruit was growing so that it wouldn't, wouldn't rot in there and then rot up the fruit. So that was a major disadvantage of Eversweet. You had to cut this off to prevent rot on it. If you're if you're in a drier climate, it probably wouldn't happen. But around here, humidity would just start rotting in there. Now there's another um, famous name in the United States called Austin. We are growing some of these too. I don't know if I'll have too much ready this year. Austin is from Syria, so a Syrian immigrant brought this pomegranate to. Austin, Texas, and grew it there. Now, interestingly, northern Texas and areas where they grow pomegranates commercially there, they can't grow the Russian ones. These are too tender to cold. The soft-seeded pomegranates won't take, you know, like northern Texas, you get down into, what, negative? I mean, they get cold. I mean, northern Texas, same latitude as we are. It's like middle of our country is unusually cold like siberian almost so they can't grow the russian varieties <laughs> they can't grow the saucy ones they have to grow the heart they said the hard seed ones are more coal tar and austin is that way so we've eaten austin it's you know they they claim it's the best pomegranate they've ever grown uh better than wonderful so we've eaten austin and the seeds are crunchy they're not stone like, like wonderful. You can, they're easy to eat the seeds on Austin. So they're fairly soft, but crunchy seeds. So they said that the, the problem with the soft seed ones is they're lousy juicers because the seeds just are so squishy in there, you can't separate it from the juice. Whereas the Austin, because they're crunchy, they separate out easily. So they said this is the best juicing one, slightly sweeter than wonderful. Uh, they claim it's much larger fruit and juicier than wonderful. I haven't had grown one in the ground yet, so I can't claim it's bigger and juicier than wonderful. But uh, certainly good fruit on Austin. So we'll continue propagating this one. Now there's another one that was brought out in the 80s called Angel Red, or actually the 90s, which was developed in the United States. It's a, um, a soft-seeded red flesh one. Uh, the first one they had, but I don't know that it compares well with the Russian ones. I haven't even eaten that one yet, uh, but it was promoted in the 90s. Yeah. We had it yeah, in the 90s and early 2000s, but the Russian ones have pretty much taken over. So I don't even know if that many of these are being grown anymore. But it is a soft-seeded red flesh one. And the claim was it was juicier than wonderful because the seeds were smaller than wonderful. Here's a novelty. So we don't like say it's called Haku Botan. Sounds Japanese. Um, it's a white flowered one with white fruit. Pretty tart. So it's really grown for its white flowers, but it does make white fruit. My daughter likes tart things, so she likes it. So we have a tree in the ground over here because she likes them. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Akubotan. There's another one out there called peach. Peach colored flowers. 
and peach colored food, we don't know how good the food is on that one. Even the, you know, there's an ornamental pomegranate called the Punica granata nana, the dwarf pomegranate that flowers and fruits year round. You know, essentially it's a, it's a tropical pomegranate too. That one makes uh, flowers and fruit year round. The fruit only get about this big, but they are pretty good tasting too. So. What is it called again? What is it called? The dwarf one? This dwarf pomegranate. The botanical name for pomegranate is Punica granatum, and that one's Punica granatum nana for being a dwarf pomegranate. Now, the these are usually a little pricier. The reason why is because on the deciduous pomegranates, it's really easy. You take a nice thick stem in the winter, take a piece of it, stick it in our acid mixed potting stool, and the darn thing grows. You get almost 100% take. The Eversweet, I mean, the uh, Aaron pomegranate never goes to sleep. And it just, for some reason, we can't make the woody cutting sprout at all. So on these, we actually have to take uh, greenwood cuttings with leaves already on them, which is means we have to keep them in a humidity dome to keep them from drying out. It's a much, you know, my, my neighbor who wanted, he tried for years to grow new plants and he couldn't, couldn't do it. That's why we got into it. He says, I can't make this work. I can't make, you know, most pomegranates are really easy to do from cuttings, but I can't make this one work. And tried for years to make cuttings for his family and relatives. So he finally told me to do it. And first we had like six cuttings make it out of about 50. Uh, we're getting better at now. We get almost one for two now. But they're still not as easy as the, uh, the deciduous ones. So we do charge a uh, premium for these just because they're harder to make cuttings. But uh, we're getting better at it. Now, there are there is one bug that seems to have come in lately, although we don't know exactly what bug it is. Um, even Dave Wilson, sales rep, tells us uh, they think it's a sucking bug, maybe a thrip that's causing this kind of foliage damage. So we think it's thrips. It might be the chili thrip that's around the area. We're not positive. Doesn't seem to affect the fruiting at all, just more aesthetics. So a lot of people don't, you know, we don't generally don't treat it, but it does mess up the new growth. It could be a, I might have to get my microscope out. It could be a, a aerified mite or microscopic mite doing this, but the chili thrips generally are noted for this kind of damage. So it could be those bugs causing it. It happens mostly in the summer and fall when chili thrips are around, so we think that's what it is, but we're, again, we're not positive. Well, thrips generally, um, for, again, for edible things, we use a product. Yeah. So the name of the bug is thrips, always with an S on the end of it there. They're the size of slivers. The adults fly, and the babies just they suck on the plant. And we use a product containing spinosad to treat for uh, the the chili drips. And oils will help a little bit, so you can alternate, you know, spinosad and oil, you know, horticultural oils. Again, it doesn't seem to affect the crop much at all. Can you use oil? Pardon? Can you use oil? Right. Okay. That'll have some of, you know, uh, Spinosad supposedly kills over 90% of thrips, not 100%, and oils may only kill about 30 or 40%, but the combination to hopefully you'll keep your plant really clean. That's it. One is on Spinosad, Captain Jacks, the ERs, Red Spinosad. Right. We actually have three um, brands now, Spinosad. And then, is, is, um, the, as the fruit matures, sometimes it'll split. What causes that? Well, splitting on fruit is generally uh, irregular moisture levels. So, um, you know, oranges, pomegranates, real easy to split those. Naval oranges split real easy. So, 
the fruit on a tree is used like a canteen. So if the tree gets dry, the fruit gives up its water to the foliage around so it shrinks. And then if you water it all of a sudden, this it, it, it expands so rapidly, sometimes the skin can't keep up with it. So it splits. Figs do that. Uh, uh, navel oranges do it easily. Pomegranates do it easily. So you keep the fruit well watered or you make sure you don't water at all. Then, you know, that's your two options. So one of the mistakes we've seen is they say, well, don't water at all. Well, if the rain comes, you're in big trouble. <laughs> so you want to keep it on the wet side. Uh, well, when the fruit's sizing up, right, you know, September, October, till you harvest it, if you let it get dry at that time and there's rain on it, they'll just all break right open. We've seen that, so. Well, most fruit production is you get bigger fruit, better, more fruit if they're in the ground, but certainly pots, you know, pot, the only difference between a pot and the ground is like a pot is just a small piece of ground. So it's got disadvantages there where it, and you have to water it more frequently to keep it wet. Or else have a really big pot and a small plant, so it'll act like the ground and stay wet all the time. But just the ground has a better water reserve, and that's the main thing. So the fruit tends to get bigger, and you don't tend to abort flowers so easily. Also, so containers are just just more maintenance. <laughs> Uh, right, the smart pots or yeah. the grow the grow bags. Yeah, so the, the the grow bags have advantages and disadvantages. So you have your fabric bags that you grow really put potting soil in there. So they the advantages they evaporate water and they stay cool. Like black plastic, especially if you're in Palm Springs. You can lose 40% of your root system just by exposure to sunlight because this side can get a, like 120, 130 degrees. Roots don't like that. Now, the plant's shading its own pot. It's not as big a deal. Pomegranates don't mind hot dirt. I mean, you know, the soil in containers, the other disadvantage of it is unless it's in one of those grow bags, it's going to be the same temperature as the air. So if it's a 100 degree day, the soil in here is 100 degrees too. Some plants hate that. Roses hate that. Cherry trees hate hot dirt. Pomegranates don't seem to care so much because they're from a hotter climate. So uh, that's not so bad. But yeah, um, this black plastic itself can get well over 120 degrees and you can actually lose up to 40 percent of your roots, especially in a small pot. Uh, if they're sitting in the sun or as a grow bag will be cooler. So, But the disadvantage is it's evaporating water like crazy. So you have to water a lot. A friend of mine, one of our former employees, that good friend, was growing plants in Sacramento or in grow bags. He says, yeah, plants do really well in there, but we got to water them all the time. So that's the disadvantage. Of, I mean, let's, you know, if you're in Texas and it's 90% humidity, it's not so bad. Bad to be in Texas, but they don't drought as fast there when the humidity is that high. It also doesn't cool as well either in that case. So, so plastic stays uh, warmer, hotter, and wetter. Like we were mentioning a few weeks ago, the disadvantage of, of black is that it gets too hot, but the other colors tend to be too cool. So our avocado supplier, used when we met them, they're growing in white plastic. Because they have to whitewash a lot of their containers and some prevent sunburn, but they switch back to black because for most of the year the avocados are growing too slow into white. It's too cold in there. Now we're, there's only about three or four months of the year where we have the danger of root burning, whereas uh, the rest of the year we're actually on the cool side for a lot of plants to grow. So the black is advantageous to that. Like uh, we grew strawberries. 30 years ago in plastic containers and red clay pots. They would not grow in the winter at all in the red clay. It was just too cold. 
whereas the, uh, the dark green plastic, they do fine. Can you do it real bad and then put it inside of the and then we have aeration and then Well, the aeration part is not important. I mean, you know, if you have lousy dirt, you know, most conventional potting soils would work better in an, in a in a cloth bag just because the soil is so bad that the roots all suffocating in there. With our top pot, it's plenty of area. It's 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 essentially uh forty percent volcanic rock. There's there's no problem with airflow in our soil. So we can put them in, you know, the most solid container you can think of. We can set them in water, they, the roots still breathe just fine. Whereas you get any other potting soil out there, it's all compost. Without adequate oxygen, your if your roots are suffocating in compost. So we that's our class for next week is is soil. So just know that we created our soils 30 years ago to to uh, make up the fact that most potting soils are of negative value. <laughs> Hate to say that, but most potting soils are of negative value. Ours can actually grow plants in. Can the top pot be um, used to grow seeds as well? The vegetable seeds? It's not considered a sterile medium. So we, we'd rather grow seeds in a sterile medium if you have a choice. So one of the classical ways to grow seeds is to use two sterile items like perlite and peat moss are both considered sterile. Mix them half and half. That's our favorite seed growing medium. Our acid mixed potting soil, which is pumice and peat, is also sterile. A little coarser texture, and we also do seeds in that. So we like that to do seeds and cuttings because it's sterile. Now, if the cutting is already healed, like drying food cuttings are already healed, they're not going to rot if you put them in our top pot. Top pot has unsterilized sand in it. That's the unsterile part. So there's a chance of rotting if you have an open wound on in top pot. But in uh, sterile mediums like these, the chance of rotting is is not major, or at least this won't contribute that much to it. So. Yes. Yes. The problem is squirrel or rat. Right. Yeah, that's that's a harsh one. Venting, well, my neighbor who grows these, they wrap each pomegranate in aluminum foil. Oh. They said the animals in their neighborhood, which are mostly raccoons and rats, don't seem to recognize aluminum foil as a fruit. Mm -hmm. So uh, they said that works fine. Fertilizer, you use the same uh, 624 for pomegranates? Yeah, it's typical. We, we, we Generally, most fruiting plants you would use the same material. And we like this one because they also have the calcium in there. This has actually got more calcium than any other mineral. And calcium is important in the uh, development of fruit and in the development of wood in a tree. So. Like our avocado growers always say, you know, mature avocado tree, 30 pounds of calcium every year. Don't forget it. It's just as important as the nitrogen. So. Can, can you share it or share with us how we should fertilize the pomegranate tree and when we I haven't seen enough documentation on the timing of fertilizer to tell you when it's best. I mean, Generally, most fruit trees require a lot of fertilizer to get them up to size, which I would say, you know, five, six foot, you want to get a good tree before you back off on the fertilizer. Most fruit trees don't need that much fertilizer to produce fruits. In fact, fertilizer is not an energy source. It actually creates negative energy in the tree because the growing, you know, when they, this is like giving you a bunch of bricks and trying to build a wall. So it's the building material, but it's not the energy. The energy is sunlight. So getting fertilizer is giving you more energy. Now, the only fruit tree they say really, really fertilize heavily to get more fruit is citrus. The testing they've done said, yeah, you fertilize them all the way through the blooming period. They seem to fruit better. 
Whereas a lot of things are the opposite. You fruit fertilizing during the flowering period and they seem to fruit worse because they're using the energy to grow leaves and stuff. So I I haven't seen too much documentation. I just haven't read enough on pomegranates. But I would say it's not that important for the fruiting. I mean, you see a lot. I see a lot of abandoned trees, you know, trees and empty lots with fruit on them. So we know that it's not essential. Although in abandoned lots, you get a lot of natural fertilizer, you know, from passing dogs and and uh, just fallen leaves. That's plenty of good fertilizer. So I just thought of the good time. So I can do how I should fertilize it because I need the top soil. So I think how often I should fertilize it, how much I should fertilize it, so that we can establish good mood and stuff Yeah, we just tell you, you know, every you know, if it's in a pot every month, you can throw something on it that's organic or in the ground about every three months. Things don't dissipate as quickly in the ground as they do in pots. Um, if you have something like this, this lasts six months, but again, it's nice to go with the organics for the long term. They seem to be a little better product in the long term. Um, it's hard to tell you how much to use. I mean, I've talked to the guys at the Soil and Plant Lab in Anaheim. There are the guys who you know, they take samples from the farms and analyze them and tell the farmer, oh, this, you need so many pounds of this, so many pounds of that. They say, you know, homeowners, you can't tell by looking at your plant what it needs. And they can't either. They have to analyze in the lab. So it's, this is always a guessing game for us, how much to use. So like this says, you know, about a cup per inch of trunk diameter whenever you fertilize it, which is maybe every three months, you know, or pomegranates, I would imagine, you know, starting early spring when they start waking up and late spring or early summer, they're growing all the way until fall and they kind of stop at that time. So that's the most important time to feed them. But we don't know. <laughs> you, know you can't, you can't. With an organic, you can't over fertilize. With the chemical, the old chemical fertilizer certainly can burn them. But with organics, yeah, you can pile this foot deep and won't hurt them. Just wasted a lot of money. In nature, I mean, the main fertilizer is dead leaves. So if you just have a lot of dead leaves on your plant, it's going to get its nutrients. Dead leaves, uh, a little bit of chicken, you know, bird manure around. <laughs> that's nature. That's, that's how nature works. For us, yeah. um, one other note on pomegranates. Uh, the, the orchards work with between one trunk and they set up to eight trunks. They don't like to go more than that. So when these trees are young, they're like all trees. They make a whole bunch of stems coming out of the dirt. A whole bunch of them. And if you let them all develop, they let them improve. They just don't have the strength. So it's better to get them down to fewer stems or fewer trunks. Uh, um, a lot of orchards that say one, but, uh, and my neighbor's tree, just one trunk, but some orchards work with up to eight. This is about two years old. Right. Now, yeah, year and a half, two years. This is about almost one year from a cutting. Same with this. They're all from last summer's cuttings. And then uh, this one is from. If we did this cutting two years, it must be three years now. And that's always been going in that pot. No, we didn't get in the smaller pot first. Right, we need to push this. Yeah. Say the stems don't don't have more than when it grows a lot of stems or something. What are you referring to? Well, the upright growth. So. The 